Okay, great. Thank you all for coming tonight. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Shannon McGinley, and I'm the Executive Director of Cornerstone. I was, have been involved in the organization nearly since its founding back in 2000, and um, we are a nonprofit nonpartisan organization here in the state of New Hampshire. Its focus is on New Hampshire, and we seek to influence public policy and uh, in issues that affect the family. So we basically, we have a, a vision for New Hampshire where God is honored, religious freedom flourishes, families thrive, and life is cherished in a nutshell. And we do that by educating legislators, educating the voting population, the faith community, and beyond on issues that affect the family and the ones that I just, just named, actually. And so we come here tonight to deal with an issue that has a lot of emotion surrounding it, the gender issues. And we have five bills that deal with this issue that are going to be before our legislature in January. And they're gonna be talked here tonight. Stephanie's gonna share uh, each one of those with you this evening, so I won't go into them right now. And things really kind of got heated up here too over the end of the summer and into the fall because of um, many of you may have read our emails and saw on Facebook the issue of the, the Medicaid funding of gender reassignment surgeries. Um, and this included not only for adults, but also for children. So, it we, so now our tax dollars are paying for these procedures. And so it really just stirred up a lot of emotion with the voters here in New Hampshire and, and legislators. And so we felt like it was really important to have an event where we could talk about this outside of the legislative session and today was the day that the legislature was meeting the house was meeting to vote on a new speaker and it would be the last time that they would be meeting before the new session began on January the 3rd and so it was a great opportunity to take advantage of the legislators being in Concord today to have a legislative briefing for them today. So we hosted a luncheon for them and um, we had some great conversation, great presentations, and, uh, and we wanted to take advantage of them being in town for the legislators to do something for, for others, for the general public, if you will, the other voters in New Hampshire. And so that's why we're having tonight. And we kind of have a twofold purpose this evening. One is is that certainly this has become a public policy issue, much to our chagrin. We never imagined 10 years ago that we would be dealing with some of these issues that we are today. But it is a public policy issue. And so as voters, we need to all educate ourselves so that we know better how to communicate to our representatives and to our senators uh, and the governor on these issues as we head into the legislative session. But second of all, and something that's even more personal, is that it really has become a personal issue. Many of us have friends or family members who are struggling with their gender identity, and we need to know how to respond. What is the best way in which to respond to a family member or a friend who is dealing with this issue? And how do we respond in love and charity and compassion? And so that's the other goal for this evening. And we hope that you leave here tonight with information that allows you to be able to communicate with your legislators, communicate with your friends, whether in the, you know, over uh, the lunch counter or whether you're at the soccer game, these conversations just organically come up. And now, after tonight, you'll be armed with some information to be able to communicate to them, and then also how to respond when you get the news that perhaps someone that you know very close to you is dealing with this issue. So uh, we've got three different speakers tonight. And uh, before I introduce them, I'm gonna just kind of share a little bit about what that format is for this evening. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 20 minutes per, uh, per person uh, here to my left, and they're gonna kind of just give like an overview, tell about themselves and, 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 and so forth. And then after that, we're gonna open it up for question and answer. And the, there's two ways that you can submit a question. One of them is through the note cards that I think you may have gotten when you checked in. And the other one is through a website that um, you can submit your question to. So for those of you who have a smartphone, you can go to the website, and I'm just blanking out on which one it is, slide, was it? Slide, okay, slide.com. So what is it, how do you spell it? S-L-I. D-O, Slido.com, I, I have such a short-term memory, Slido.com. 
S L I D O dot com, and then you just type in Cornerstone and where it prompts you, and then you can just submit the question that way, and it'll make things go a little bit faster when we're trying to read through the the questions, because many of you might have the same question, and so you can just like the question that maybe somebody else had asked. So we'll have probably about 30 minutes of question and answer after each person takes their 20 minutes, and then I'll I'll dismiss folks who need to leave uh, and then we're open to staying later if you want to continue the conversation. So our first speaker this me this evening is Renee Jax. Um, Renee is from California. Um, she is a former San Francisco police officer. She'll tell you more about that. Um, she's now the author of seven books. She worked for 25 years as, a, has worked for 25 years as a project man manager for software, mostly for banks, and she's lived all over the world in 20 different countries, and she's also, <laughs> and fun fact, had food poisoning in 20 countries, too. <laughs> so, uh, and then we, we have uh, Stephanie Curry. Uh, uh, this evening who's an attorney with the Family Policy Alliance in Colorado Springs. Um, she supports uh, state policy groups like ours in terms of public policy. So I work really closely with Stephanie because um, she's able to kind of share with us some things that have worked in other states, some things that haven't worked in other states, uh, and it's just been just an incredible resource. So she'll be sharing a little bit of her expertise this evening. And then David Pickup is with us this evening from Dallas, Texas. He's a licensed psychotherapist whose main practice is reintegrative therapy, primarily for men and boys, and he defends the rights of therapists and clients all over the country. We actually had David uh, come to New Hampshire. We flew him up last legislative session to testify during the therapy ban uh, debate in the, the committee, and I've come to know David and appreciate his expertise so very much. So first it's going to be Renee, then David, and then Stephanie. Renee, please. Knock him dead, Jax. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, it's what, Thursday night here in New Hampshire? <laughs> well, you know, out in California, they have their own time zones and everything, so. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a great session with the legislators uh, earlier in the day. And I see some of you did manage to come. And once, uh, once again, I, I guess, you know, when you fell asleep in the first session, you felt you needed to come back and hear it again. So uh, when I was in school, they said you should always start a, a speaking engagement with a joke. OK, so I'm going to tell a joke. So there's a lot of women here. So I'll say, a man walks into a doctor's office. <laughs> and he says, doctor. I've been doing a lot of research on the internet, and I'm convinced my right lung has cancer. And the doctor says, yes. And he says, yeah, I, I've got cancer in my right lung, and um, I want you to remove my right lung. And the doctor looks at him and says, well, are, OK? And he says, what's a good day for you? He says, well, we're going on holiday. We're going to do a cruise. When I get back on the 26th, how about maybe the 29th? He said, well, see my secretary. And uh, you know, when you get back, we'll do your blood work, and I'll take that lung out. Now, normally, when you hear something so ludicrous, you're waiting for the punchline. The punchline is this is a reality in the United States. Every day, 10 people a day are self-diagnosing their gender conditions and demanding, without any pushback from their psychiatrist or their doctors, to have perfectly healthy organs removed. The bum bum. There's your punchline. 10 people a day. Last year, 3,500 people in the United States had sex changes. That's your punchline. Now, when we talk about sex changes, and I'll go into more of this, um, to a lot of people, to legislators, this issue is purely academic. You might have one or two friends of a friend of a friend, and their kids are struggling, or their brother changed his sex or something. To me, to me, this 
it, this debate around sex changes is personal because I am a transsexual. I was born male in 1955. Um, I was confused by the time I, uh, about my gender role by the time I was six. By the time I'm 20, I'm living full time on hormones. And um, by, I think I was 40 when I finally had enough money to have a sex change. So I, of all the people here, maybe not one or two of you, I have literally and figuratively flesh and blood in this debate. And surprisingly, I'm not going to be telling you what you think I, as a transsexual activist, am going to tell you. So my mother was schizophrenic, was committed to a mental health institute. My father <clears throat> was an alcoholic, abandoned the, my mother and us three kids. My brother and sister older than us, than myself. Uh, uh, once my mother was by herself, she went into full schizophrenia and was committed to Fort Logan Mental Health Institute in Denver, Colorado. Because I was a little boy, um, because I was a little boy, there was no place for me. We were a poor family, so I spent most of my childhood accompanying her uh, to Fort Logan, uh, going to um, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, Saturday meetings. Uh, the nurses basically cared for me as a babysitter. And it was during this time that I read some of my first books on sexuality. I'm 10 years old. They put me in the medical library, and I'm reading books that I really shouldn't have read. And one of them was Harry Benjamin's book, The Transsexual Phenomena, released in 1969 uh, by Harry Benjamin, who had been giving boys estrogen since 1947. He, by the time he finished his career, he had uh, given over 4,000 boys estrogen treatments. So um, when they say I'm a police officer, I was the very first transsexual police officer in the world. In 1980, I was a male living w with male anatomy, living as a, a woman, and I decided I wanted to help my community because there was a lot of anti-gay uh, attacks, anti-transsexual attacks. I was very, very involved in the gay community. And I thought I could help by being a cop. And there was a legal loophole after a year of, of uh, fighting the San Francisco Police Department. I nailed him against the wall legally and I got sworn in. For the next three years, my life was a living hell just from gender. The other officers were verbally, physically abusive, uh, vandalized my car repeatedly, uh, trashed my, if I dressed in the station house, they trashed my clothes. And what has damaged me from that was that I could never get a backup. Law enforcement only works when an individual feels it's not in his best interest to continue being a, a nasty person, okay? So you need a couple uniforms. The more uniforms, the, the, the greater the risk of continuing to be a nut. So that in, you go down to New York, and on their calls, they put six or seven. Well, when I call up on my radio, I, I don't know if they're still called pick radios, um, they'd, the other cops, the straight cops, would mess with their radios, and I couldn't get a backup. And I kept getting injured because a lot of people, especially people on drugs, don't respect one uniform, and so you're always fighting. So eventually, I ended up in the hospital, unable to walk for about six months because of a fight, because I couldn't get a backup, and I have an intimate relationship with ceiling tiles. And when you can't walk and you've been abused, both as a transsexual, as a transsexual police officer, your family's abandoned you. Everything that we need to feel part of a society has been stripped from you. You stare up at the ceiling, and I gotta use a profanity, what the hell was I thinking? So after that, um, I uh, left the department once I was able to walk. I uh, was thrown out of my apartment because I didn't have money. I lived in my car with a bad back for many, many months after that. I became a dominatrix, got addicted to uh, crack cocaine. What else did I do? I had a good time. I don't remember most of it. Um, and eventually, 
went into project management. I had my sex change in 1990 at Dr. Stanley Biber. And you should understand the world as it was before transsexuality was weaponized by, by the left wing. And I fully believe it has been weaponized against the conservatives, against the religious people in our country. Is when I had my sex change, Dr. Biber was in business for 40 years in Trinidad, Colorado, <clears throat> and did 4,000 sex changes. That's eight a month average. We're now talking 10 a day, okay? And <clears throat> what's really interesting about transsexuality is I've been writing books now for many years, and I, as I'm facing <clears throat> the business end, the muzzle end of age 60, I said, you know, I got to get down and really answer the basic questions. So I, I said the, the place to start is back in that medical library. So I did three long years of research recently, looked at all of the medical texts, look at all of the research papers that you hear quoted all over the place. And what I discovered much to my own horror, because when I read it when I was 14, I trusted doctors. I trust doctors with a bottle of salt now. When I read these books when I was 15, I missed a major point, is they're prescribing treatments, they're prescribing surgeries, they're prescribing hormones, they're prescribing puberty blockers now. They don't know what causes it. This gentleman, just the other day, uh, two weeks ago I think it was, this gentleman went to his doctor and he's, he's, he's got a low grade temperature and he's not feeling right. And he says, you know, I, I, the throat and the doctor, and we've all done this, the doctor says, well, you have a, a bacterial infection of unknown origin. And I'm gonna give you some amoxicillin. You take the amoxicillin and um, it doesn't do anything. And then you go back and he gives you zip, uh, zithro. And then you go back and he gives you something else and it turns out it was an abscess in the tooth. You know something, you can stop taking the, the urethromycin and you can go back to a state previously. <laughs> With sex change surgery, they don't know the cause of and they're guessing all my research proves this. My life experience of a half a century proves this. They're guessing at the treatment. And what, what I, I can definitely tell you is the, 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 treatment, the treatment doesn't fix the anxiety. It does for like three weeks when you get home and you get to show your pussy, excuse me, you get to show your, your new genitalia. I'm an old street cop, forgive me. <laughs> you get to show, you know, it's, it's like um, uh, all my friends said, you know, this is really a lot more information than we wanted. And I said, listen, I just paid $25,000 for this holiday, and I'm going to show you the slides. <laughs> <laughs> I took pictures leading into the surgery room. The book I wrote is Don't Get on the Plane, and there's a picture of me going into the surgery suite. It's my feet like this. I took pictures, and the doctor said, what the hell are you doing? And I said, I've paid $25,000 for this ride, and I want to document it. If I went to France on the money, you know I'd have a picture of the bed in the hotel. So what a, there's a moment of elation, but then you, you just crash again. And we know this to be true because there's been three solid scientific research papers over the past 25 years that show um, transsexuals have, post-op transsexuals have the highest suicide rate of all people on this planet. Do you know what the suicide rate for most people are? And those of you who heard it today, you can't say anything. Put your hand down. Um, the suicide rate, I just looked it up, is 0.6% of the population. 0.6% of the population. And the transsexual movement, the trans activists say, uh, hold it, hold it, hold it. That's because our mothers don't love us. 
because there's not legislation protecting us and because they're southern southern bigots pick, driving pickup trucks with the confederate flag in the back chasing little transies down the street what it is is not bigotry but biology our biology is a binary sex bi biology too there's there's uh, some other stuff you know but it's two and you say well there's gender let me explain gender to you folks John Money was an Australian from Wellington and he came up here and he was doing uh, research he was the first doctor who really looked at uh, this condition scientifically in 1955 he wrote a paper identifying gender as a concept to dis to convey this confusion he saw in his patients. Um, Fourteen years later, uh, Harry Benjamin wrote the transsexual phenomena in which he extrapolated and did a nice little chart. He loved charts, um, which showed the range of gender. Then the following year, Robert Jesse Stoller wrote his book, Sex and Gender. And for, Benjamin was too old school. He came from Germany. He was Jewish. English was not his uh, first language. Robert Jesse Stoller was a true American scientist, and his lingo resonated with the American society. So when he wrote his second book, The Transsexual Phenomena, in which he said, gender is a range of things and a rainbow, it caught on in the lay per person. It caught on, and now we believe that gender can be separate from anatomy. There has been no scientific research, hard science, that indicates anything like that. Nobody's done it because it's just accepted as truth. So let me put on my glasses, look at my notes, because I only have a few minutes. You can tell that being a transsexual has its issues. And the reason we have the highest suicide rate ever, other than maybe dentist with five wives and is about to divorce his sixth wife, is that it's post-surgical. And how many of you, and I believe in my heart, that African Americans have been discriminated and face discrimination? Yeah. How about Hispanics? Absolutely. How about gay men? Absolutely. Women in corporate culture have been discriminated against. Why is their suicide rate not above 0.6? And transsexual suicide rate, after they get what they want, after we get what we want, is every other person. Now, look at this room. We've got 100 people here. Everybody. You've all had sex changes. Every person on this side of the room will attempt suicide. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, suicide, no, yes, no, yes, no. We are talking every other person sitting next to you attempting suicide. It is a mental health issue. All of my friends and I have been deep involved with the transsexual community have mental illness. And so when you hear them say, well, it's because we're not loved by our mothers. No, it's because there's other things going on here that medicine has dropped the ball. So the solution, the first thing to stop this epidemic, and it looks from all indication to double every year for the foreseeable future. Uh, there's 3,500 this year. Next year, we're looking at 8,000 in the U.S. In the U.K., they are getting 50 gender teenagers every day wanting sex changes. This is epidemic, and the AMA won't talk about it. The APA won't talk about it. And the solution, first and foremost, let's not create more. Let's, my solution is let's stop the surgical style, uh, 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 putting kids into the, uh, the sex change system and prohibit kids under the age of 18 from having puberty blockers, uh, cross-sex hormones, and, and sex changes. You have to stop, stop 
it's like you can't fix a dam, you know, you can't deal with the flooding if you haven't fixed the dam. We have to stop the dam first and foremost. Um, why am I doing this? And a question that was asked earlier that um, I haven't been able to get to. Two minutes? Can I have two? Four minutes. Oh, boy. Thank you. Um, why am I still living like this if I believe it's the wrong lifestyle? Uh, Walt Hayer, who is an excellent man, went through the same procedure a couple years earlier than I, went to Stanley Biber, had a sex change, lived for 10 years, and went back, realized this isn't it, and he went back to living as a man. And he got married. He's been, I, I think he has a ministry. He is a great guy. He, he leads a transition group. People in the trans community, the gay activists, say he wasn't really a transsexual. He was a transvestite. He was a cross-dresser. And when I wrote, don't get on the plane, sex change can ruin your life, I'm reading all of the blogging, the nasty, vicious blogging about Walt. And I said, people have got to see, I've got 40 years, uh, 50 years of dealing with this, 40 years cross-living. I've got breast implants. They're 25 years old. My health from 40 years of hormones, massive doses of female hormones has destroyed my body. Most women go on hormone replacement therapy when they're 60, 65, 70. I went on when I was uh, 17 and my body is decaying. I have, I've been, uh, I should be, uh, my doctor the other day said I'm the equivalent of a, a woman 100 years old that's been on estrogen for 40 years. My eyes, I've got problems. And it's related to all of these drugs. It's related to having breast implants. It's related to having to overdose on estrogen to hide my masculinity. Not that my personality helps in any way. <laughs> so listen, I'm here to be an advocate for our children. Let's stop the epidemic. Let's, let's stop the dam from flooding us first. We, we need your support. Uh, Shannon and her group need your support. David, from a therapeutic uh, uh, perspective, is here to lend support. This woman is amazing, Stephanie, and she understands the legalities that they're trying to push down our throats. My mother, who rejected me after I, I came out to her, never talked to me up until the time she died. It, I saw her a day before she died. She said, when a person takes the time to tell you the truth, please listen. Thanks. Good evening. My name is David Pickup. Uh, as has been said already, I'm a licensed psychotherapist, uh, primarily in Dallas, Texas, where my main practice is, and um, I'm also licensed in California. My primary practice is dealing with boys and men who have gender and especially uh, sexuality issues, specifically homosexuality issues. I want to tell you a story about a client who many, many years ago, five years old, for all we know, a handsome, sweet little boy, well, several times, his next door neighbor, and virtually an adult male, sexually molested him. Took him in his tent in the backyard several times and sexually molested him. The boy began to grow up, became essentially uh, <coughs> defensively detached from dad because dad never touched him until he was 13. Uh, was bullied by his peers mercilessly for years later on in, groups, in school groups <coughs> uh, because he was a bit more sensitive and turned out to be a little bit effeminate <coughs> because, as it turned out, his mom and his dad weren't getting along so well and mom, being a sensitive person, knowing she had a handsome, sensitive little boy, turned to her boy for some male need fulfillment of her own because her marriage wasn't working out very well, not very emotionally satisfying. 
So he became, in a kind of a sense, a surrogate husband for comfort. So little boy enmeshed with mom and took on more of an identity of a female perspective and therefore the bullying later on, that kind of thing. This boy never knew what it was like to navigate through conflicts. Uh, the, the, uh, he, the sexual abuse was repressed for many years until he was about 19, 20, something like that. And he grew up the good little boy, perfect in religion, perfectionist attitude, had to be there for everybody else. In essence, he lost his childhood and he had to be there for everybody else, especially his parents and everybody else because that's the way he felt loved and accepted. Then about 13 years of age, all of a sudden terror upon terrors because his religiosity, not the, not the sincere kind in, in my opinion, but the, the, the shame-based kind of religiosity that was hanging around his environment, he felt so much shame because he actually had sexual attractions that were emerging for other boys, and especially older boys, much older boys, and later on developed into sexual attractions for men. But like a good little boy, he repressed everything. He suppressed everything. Repression is defined as you don't even know you're, you're not conscious of shoving things down. Suppression is you know you're shoving it down. So it all happened to him. But he went through and got through high school and went to college and just said, you know, some days these feelings will go away. And then one day in his late 20s, he saw uh, an erotic magazine, a porn magazine of a guy fully naked with a full on erection. There it is hanging out for all the world to see. And his mind was blown. And he thought, wow, I'm sexually attracted to men full on. So he never identified as gay because he had too many, too much religious scruples for that. But he had intermittent uh, sexual encounters, erotic massages, things like that, and knew that there was something that was, that was missing. He knew that he wasn't born gay. He knew he was designed for heterosexuality. He had dated girls. He was, uh, had some successful relationships with girls. But he, he knew that there was something emotionally going on. He knew he wasn't born that way. And so finally, being going into full-on adulthood, about 30 years of age, he finally got the courage to walk into a, a very fine, very well-trained, brilliant psychotherapist who opened his mind up, who wrote some books that when he read them, the light bulbs went off. And he realized what his real issues were. It was the sexual abuse. It was the emotional enmeshment with mom, in part. It was dad not ever showing him any kind of love, affection, affirmation, approval. He accessed the tragedy and the grief that comes to all children who were not in the therapy office, who were not essentially loved, to make a very long story short. Not intentionally, by the way. These are essentially good people at heart. Nobody's here to blame and maim anybody, but who just didn't know, who didn't get it. And so after, to make a long, very long story short, this client uh, did the emotional work that was necessary to access all these issues that came up. And it took years to really fully uh, in those days of this inculcated shame-based inferiority complex, he felt he wasn't really uh, a boy, not really a man. And so the, the projections of his computer programming for maleness, if you will, got projected out onto the body of, his other, of other men. And so maleness was an object to him. And anything that's an object to a person can become a sexual object, especially when it involves unmet, unrequited love needs. So when he accessed all these, these horrific things and he went through a lot of grief work and a lot of anger work and a lot of compassion and this therapy, this therapy was emboldened by two great principles, truth, in this case psychological truth, and unconditional compassion. 
And when he had those experiences for long enough, guess what happened within those years? He lost all his homosexual feelings. And what he got in return because of this marvelous process called psychodynamic therapy, he got what it feels like that probably most of you men have taken for granted, and, probably, and no problem with that, for your whole lives. He got the joy of maleness that he felt subjectively in his own body. He felt what it felt like in his, in his own mind, his heart, his body, to feel what it feels like to be a man. And when he took on that subjective experience and, in short, healed those, those issues, here's what the world doesn't tell you at all. His homosexual feelings automatically dissipated. Not because of some behavioral program or pray away the gay or some uh, religious boot camp that makes no sense at all or some kind of shame-based aversion electroshock therapy, which is if you look my name up on the thing, you, you'll think that I do electroshock evidently. No, it was, a tr it was an emotionally transformative experience, not just behavioral change. It was a marvelous and excruciatingly hard but ultimately rewarding transformative emotional experience. And so, and that guy's uh, heterosexual attractions increased as well. So that's what I do. I'm a psychotherapist who handles the thousands and thousands, conducts therapy, professional licensed therapy for thousands of men and boys all over this country, me and my colleagues, and in a lot of other countries as well. And that's what real therapy is all about. And can I tell you, your legislators on the Hill or on the Capitol, well, if it's on a Hill, but I don't think it is, but on the, in the Capitol. Wherever it is. Wherever it is, in the Capitol right now, right now, are deciding to vote yes or no on a bill that makes it absolutely illegal for that child and that therapist to have any of those therapeutic experiences. It's in the text. It prohibits directly and indirectly exactly kind of the experiences that I'm telling you about. And by the way, that client, that was me. So, God bless, and I mean that sincerely, our LGBT activists. I understand them, maybe more than they realize. My first principles for every person who has these issues or even whatever they believe is truth and compassion. And you know what? I'm a firm believer in compassion, but you can't really have compassion if you don't have the truth. Yeah. Amen. So, what are we supposed to tell our children who are going through very similar stories of transgender issues as homosexuality, in a sense, not, not completely separate. They're not completely uh, the same, but they they're, have very similar underpinnings. What are we supposed to tell our children and our grandchildren and their children and their children about gender and sexuality? This story is what you are intentionally, by design, prohibited from hearing in the major media, the local media, sometimes through in my opinion, not very much courage and, and neglect through churches. Uh, these are the issues that people don't want to face. And one of the reasons why I'm here tonight is to help inspire you to stand for compassion and truth. You're not going to be able, in my life experience and in my opinion, professional experience as well, you're not going to be able to truly love your children unless you raise them to be authentic from birth. Raise them not to a stereotype of masculinity or femininity, but to an authentic experience that is developed through one man and one woman marriage in which gender identity is a, and, and biological identity is a process that happens naturally that we are designed, designed by God to experience. Don't rob your children or your grandchildren or the society by at least, at least here, I want you to tonight hear that I'm advocating for at least telling people about another story. I testify in many state legislative committees, uh, have for the past four years about these same issues. And 
they, they listen to these stories and some of those senators and representatives sit there and hear exactly what I'm telling you and they, they press the green yes button for a therapy ban instead because the LGBT activists have gotten millions of dollars and they come out vociferously and claim that people like me are the most horrific white, white right-wing bigoted people you'll ever want and hateful people you've ever wanted to see. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't think I've displayed much hatred here tonight. I'm talking about compassion and truth, but the other side, God bless them, is leaving off the truth. At the very least, they're not telling you the rest of the story. Remember Paul Harvey years ago? I think it was his great show for decades, the rest of the story. That's who I am tonight, is Paul Harvey of the sexuality issues. So if maybe some of you are dealing with family members who have these issues. Maybe, maybe you yourself are dealing with these issues. I'm not demanding anything of you. I don't go in legislative committees and demand and call people evil and horrible and tell them they're sick or they should change or else or tell them they're going to hell and all this, all this stuff. I don't do that. I tell them there's another side to the story. I tell them there's another story that, the, to be frank, the LGBT activists are not allowing this story to get out. But it's out tonight. Talk about coming out. It's out tonight. <laughs> What I'm saying is that there's a way for your children and yourselves and your and ge later generations to have at least another option. There is a wonderful experience awaiting them. And yeah, sometimes that needs to be in a, in a therapist's office who knows what he's doing, who's trained, who has compassion and will challenge uh, uh, the, the client, not in a horrible way, but in a supportive way. That's part of our job. The answers are there if one is motivated. There are, there are a lot of uh, LGBT folks, let's face it, that simply aren't motivated. They're not interested in change. Okay. In this country, they have every right. They have every right to live the way that they believe they were born to or the, the way that they want to. I, I'm not here to say you can't be gay. You can. You can be anything you want. But what you can't do, unless you let these rights corrode, even in your state, is force me to believe that I don't have my own story. Amen. Is force your children, let other people force your children in the schools to tell your children who they are. What you can't do, constitutionally even, is do that unless you sit and say nothing. Do I think it's hard to stand up for rights as parents, as grandparents, as uh, uh, as citizens, as school board members, as parents of, of uh, school children? Yes, I do. I'm fully telling you tonight, it's hard. It's hard to stand up and have an LGBT activist cussing in your ear or telling you, you, you electro electroshock children. But you know what? It is absolutely worth it. It is absolutely worth it. I actually, I believe by God, have gotten the uh, the, the, the opportunity to actually testify for truth and compassion in state legislatures all over the country. If you told me four years ago that I would be doing this, I would go, what are you kidding? I'm not politics, huh? But here it is, and here I am, and I get to have the joy of what it's like to fight for an eight-year-old little boy or a 15-year-old girl or a 25 or a 35 or 45 year old man or woman that thought there was no hope for them because the world absolutely insists that they are, if they have any kind of aberrant feeling at all, that, well, they've got to identify with it. So I'm here to tell you the rest of the story, and I hope I've done a pretty good job of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. I'm Stephanie Curry, as Shannon introduced me, and I'm with Family Policy Alliance. And I am here to just review a few of the pieces of legislation that you're facing here in New Hampshire and the effects of the legislation that maybe 
hasn't crossed your mind and what's going on especially and particularly in our schools and thank you so much Shannon for putting this event on and Cornerstone and the hard work we're doing next. thank you we met, I don't know what you were doing this afternoon, but we were meeting with legislators and discussing this legislation and had some great conversation and they were really engaged and that is just a very small example of the hard work Cornerstone has been doing over many, many years fighting and lobbying for family values and your rights and your children, even when you weren't aware, when you were sleeping, their, their small staff was just fighting away. So God bless them and the work they're doing and may it continue. And this is um, evidence of that work that they've been doing. So one of the bills that has come up is, as David was telling us, was therapy ban bills. And those bills, basically, there are 10 states that have prohibited therapy, psychotherapy, for children that are struggling with unwanted, and that's the key word, unwanted same-sex attraction and gender dysphoria, unwanted gender dysphoria. So these bills would make it illegal in New Hampshire for David to talk to your child about struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction. So if your family value is to have your child have their heterosexu heterosexuality affirmed or their biological sex affirmed, they would be prohibited, if this bill is passed, from going to a psychotherapist and talking through those issues. And as David has been telling us over the past few days, every single case he has encountered of a child that is struggling with homosexuality has gone through trauma. And I'm not sure if he mentioned that quite yet this evening, but that he hasn't yet encountered a case, and I hope he discusses that more, of a child who has not experienced some trauma in facing that. And so Family Policy Alliance and Cornerstone are deeply concerned that these bills will prevent your child from talking to those issues. It almost, in a way, forces the narrative upon our children that they were born this way, and it forces the sexuality of the abuser on your child and doesn't give them a way out. It doesn't give them any other path other than to go the direction of their abuser or repressing the trauma that they feel and it doesn't give them a way to work through it. So these therapy ban bills are dangerous and we really need to be thinking about our children and what it means and maybe you don't have a child who's struggling with that or maybe you don't know of a child in your life who needs this kind of therapy but as parents we really need to be aware that it's really not the right of legislators to tell us what we should believe and how we should teach our children we have the constitutional right and god-given right what we believe to direct the upbringing of our children and to raise them and put in those moral guidelines into their lives and that's the parents responsibility not the legislators so that's the therapy ban bill that is on the table and being considered by your legislators that we are trying to stop and do not want that to go through another one that is a good bill is to ban gender reassignment surgery or sex change operations and we're absolutely for banning that we're also for banning the hormones and I wanted to talk briefly about the process of what that looks like because some of you maybe this is the first time you're hearing hearing about puberty suppression hormones so basically puberty suppression hormones put the pause button on puberty they delay it and the very early stages of puberty in young children can start as early as six and that's just the oily skin. It's a very weak release of hormones, acne, um, pubic hair under the arms, but it does start at an early age. And then the second stages start a little later. And the third stage is where you start to see, of course, the, we all know puberty, the development of those sex, sex characteristics. Puberty suppression <coughs> hormones delay that process and they stop the development of those sex characteristics and it stops the secretion of certain hormones in the brain. Um, the Endocrine Society, which uh, does a lot of work with hormones and, and puberty suppression drugs, recommends that hormone these puberty suppression drugs are prescribed when the child is 9 or 10 years old. 9 or 10 years old. In Australia, they have started treating children as young as 4. 
And we are headed in that direction with puberty suppression drugs. We don't even know all the effects hormone have on the body. The brain, we know it affects the brain. It changes the brain. It changes the body. There's so many overlapping physiological processes that are going on with the hormones in the body, and we're stopping that. And the left will say, there's no harm, but puberty isn't a disease that needs to be stopped. And they would have you believe that it's a disease that needs to be treated if there is a child suffering from gender dysphoria. Puberty suppression drugs were originally for children that were developing too early at the age of six or seven, and they were used to stop the biological process for a medical condition that we understand. And they've started to be used to treat children that say, I, I'm a boy, but I think I'm a girl at the age of four. What does your four-year-old, what, what choices can your four-year-old make? What decisions do you trust your four or five-year-old to make? But you're gonna let your child come to you and say, I feel like maybe I'm a girl. I, I have twin boys and they're four, and my son went through a stage where he loved the color pink. And I was a stay-at-home mom for a couple years. And my son, he, loved, he wanted to do what mommy does. He would see me put on makeup. Oh, mom, can I put on makeup? And I'd say, no, honey, you know, you can't put on makeup. But they would just see mommy spend time with me and want to do some things that they saw mommy doing. But mommy knows that my son isn't a girl. I know that my son is a boy. And I'm not going to let him put on makeup or tell me that I want to put on mascara. He got into my nail polish once. I didn't run him to the doctor to get puberty <laughs> suppression drugs. And so that is, uh, we should be scared about that. So those drugs are stopping the process of puberty and they're stopping the development of your child's physical body. Then when the child reaches the age of puberty, when, the, when they will start to naturally develop those sex characteristics, if they're on those drugs, that process isn't going to start. So they'll put your child on cross-sex hormones. So the cross-sex hormones allows your child to develop the secondary and primary sex characteristics of the opposite sex. Irreversible. Your child, so let's say you have a, a girl who has gone through puberty suppression drugs, so she hasn't developed breasts. Now she's taking cross-sex hormones. So now her face is gonna be masculinized. Um, she's gonna have, and it, it's a little graphic, I'm sorry, but this is what's happening. Clitoral enlargement, masculine features. Um, her breasts won't develop, they'll atrophy. And here's the kicker. These drugs are sterilizing your children, sterilizing them, probably permanently. And here's the thing about the numbers. 80 to 95% of children who say that they're, they think they might be the opposite sex, who are struggling with gender dysphoria, 80 to 95% will outgrow it by adulthood. 80 to 95% will identify with their, what you might hear natal sex, their biological sex. Once they reach adulthood, it's resolved. Now they may have some other issues that they need to work through and continue to get therapy, but generally they're gonna go on and live their life as their biological sex. Children who have received this treatment, how many of them do you think go on to have cross-sex surgery? 100%. So if we are treating our children with these treatments, we are pushing them in the direction to have these irreversible, sterilizing surgeries that cause lifelong problems. Cross-sex hormones, that's a lifelong that's a lifelong medical treatment. That's for the rest of your life. Even after the sex change surgery, you're still on those cross-sex hormones. And so at 18 is usually when the surgery takes place or it's allowed, although there has been, the left is fighting for a younger age. Um, and that, that's a major surgery. So if you're a woman and you, you think you're a, you're a guy, you can get a, you know, a fake penis, you're, you, you can get your breasts removed, pectoral implants, fake testes, um, some laser surgery, masculine jaw surgery, and obviously the other way around is much more expensive, much more expensive. Um, a man can get his penis removed, obviously, fake vagina, um, some breast implants, 
And as Renee has been explaining, there's a lot of health problems that she's, she's suffered, and they don't talk about that. So these, these bills will prevent that from happening. And the state does a lot to protect your children medically, and there's a lot of things the state prohibits your children from doing. You, you, your child can't drink, child can't vote, probably can't buy themselves cough syrup at the pharmacy, probably can't get Tylenol at school, and yet your school is talking to your child about their gender behind your back. And that's another bill that's on the table is to um, have gender identity be a protected class. And you'll hear it referred to as a non-discrimination bill. And as a minority, that's a little offensive to me because, uh, and as David said, we're not for bullying, compassion, and truth, and treating everybody with love. And I absolutely believe in that. But I do not believe that there is a, um, it's a discrimination issue. As I was saying earlier, we don't have gay straight water fountains. We don't have institutionalized state oppression of, of gays and transsexuals. We don't have that here. And so to create a protected class for gender identity creates a lot of far-reaching effects in the law, and it, it runs deep. And let me illustrate a few examples. A couple will be in your school, um, in schools, and you've all heard of bathroom bills, locker rooms being open to the opposite sex. Imagine with me a young lady who thinks she's a boy, and she goes into the, she's allowed to use the locker room because now schools are saying that gender identity is what really should drive who can use bathrooms and locker rooms. So she's undressing in the locker room with other adolescent boys because she says she's a boy. Is that really protecting the privacy and dignity of that young lady? Is that a situation in which that young lady is not going to be bullied? You might hear it as an anti-bullying policy, so you have a young lady in a bathroom with boys undressing. They're all traumatized, and David, I hope he speaks to this, um, boys get traumatized too, looking at bodies too soon, and just like girls do. They both are traumatized and exposed to more bullying, and that's not a dignified situation, I, I don't believe, for either party, and yet schools are allowing this to happen. They're taking away your child's choice to decide when your child is, it should be their decision when they decide I'm gonna allow a boy to see me or a girl to see me or when they want to be naked in front of the opposite sex and hopefully that's a choice they make later in life. But schools are making that choice for you. And so we really need to get to our school boards and be loud and voicing our concerns and saying this isn't okay as a parent. If children, grandchildren, this isn't okay. I don't want my children going on field trips and sleeping in a hotel room with the opposite sex. That's not okay. So that's what's taking place. Uh, and sex ed curriculums, if I may mention that really quickly. Uh, if last session, Nevada passed a bill that required sex ed curriculums to include gender identity and sexual orientation. So now your sex ed curriculums have to not only talk about normal sex, what we all learn, but they also have to take into account gay sex and the sex of trans, transgender people. And they're talking about all of this. And that's another thing you have to be aware of too. Planned Parenthood is, is really lobbying for those comprehensive sex ed curriculums and that's what they're calling them. So that bill is definitely a concern and that's the, 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 the bill that would make gender identity a protected class. So that's in schools, but also in employment, in churches, and we're seeing a lot of lawsuits. If sex means gender, that means for example, someone like Renee could go into the hospital and say, um, I would like a sex change operation because I'm a woman and it's medically necessary. I have gender dysphoria. This is a medically necessary operation. And because I'm a woman, I'm entitled to the surgery and that should be covered by Medicaid. And I should also get my breast removed and get maybe some hair implants and laser surgery to get rid of the facial hair. And that's all covered under Medicaid. And who's paying for that? We're paying for that. 
it's a similar thing to abortion and the abortion laws and the morality and what, what we're paying for and what taxpayers are responsible for. So when you start having gender identity as a protected class, and we're starting to see it, uh, hospitals are being sued. Catholic doctors are being sued for refusing these surgeries. Um, hospitals are being sued for refusing these surgeries and saying, no, let's get you some other help. There is no science, to back, no study, none, to back up the gender dysphoria treatment. There's nothing that allows puberty suppression hormones to be used for the treatment of gender dysphoria. Nothing, hasn't been any long-term studies. No evidence that sex change operations actually help gender dysphoria. As Renee was saying, the suicide rate, 41%. 41% after the surgery. One analogy I like to use is someone suffering from anorexia. We don't allow that person to go get a liposuction and a tummy tuck. And even if they did and they said, well, I feel better about myself after they have surgery, um, I think most of us can agree that doesn't fix the underlying condition. We nip that in the bud beforehand and say, no, you need to go see a psychotherapist and get some psychodynamic therapy. We're not gonna operate on you. And even if we did allow an operation to happen, we probably all know that that anorexic person would still struggle with body dysphoria. And there's many examples of that. And that is our stance on gender dysphoria, is it is a psychological condition that is being treated with medical and physiological treatments, and that's not the right treatment. We need to find other ways, other compassionate ways of treating people suffering with gender dysphoria. And let's see what other bills quickly here. We have the therapy ban, prohibition on gender, um, adding gender identity as a protected class, and there are a couple bills, good bills, that would prohibit your Medicaid dollars from covering gender reassignment surgeries and the hormones, which I think I've covered pretty well why that's a good thing. We do not want our tax dollars to go to cover gender reassignment surgeries or hormones, especially for our children. And there's a final bill that I won't spend too much time on, but this bill would add sex reassignment surgery and say that if you allow your child to get sex reassignment surgery, that should be child abuse. And while we agree that it is abuse to allow your child to get sex reassignment surgery, we don't want to criminalize parents. And the reason for that is because parents are trusting doctors. Parents can't be expected to go through all the medical articles. They don't have the medical training. And that's what's happening with the therapy bans. Well, let me tell you where we're going with the therapy bans that I did not mention is, for example, in Massachusetts, they proposed a bill to prohibit psychotherapy for those dealing with unwanted same-sex attraction. And if you allow your child to get psychotherapy, that is a reportable offense. You can be charged with child abuse for doing that. Thank God that bill failed this session, but it took a year for us to get to that point, but I imagine we'll be seeing it again. Canada just passed a law that your child can be taken away um, if you allow your child to have psychotherapy, and that's kind of the path we're headed down. Child abuse, for you to have your child go see a therapist, and if they struggle with sexual abuse, that, that's not a factor. And some states are trying to include therapy bans for adults. So we're going down this path. We don't want to criminalize parents. They don't have the information. It's the doctors that we need to hold accountable. It's the medical community that we need to hold, hold accountable. It is those who are in possession of the information and the facts that go to medical school, that are conducting the studies that we need to hold accountable to the numbers. Um, and parents, we just need to be aware and be an advocate for our children and be informed. And if something doesn't feel right, ask questions, be bold. Don't be afraid to stand up and ask and find out information because our children's lives are on the line here and we're all fighting for that. So thank you. Thank you to all of you for taking the time to share 
the information that you did. So we have several questions that have been submitted online. And for those of you who would like to write them down, put the card in the air, and I'll have uh, Gabrielle come around and collect the card. So just wave them here so she knows who wants to turn one in. So, okay, so we're gonna start with our question and answer time. We're gonna take about 30 minutes to do question and answer, and then we'll kind of formally end the program, but we can continue in a more informal manner just to um, allow the conversation to continue, but I don't want you to feel like you're being rude if you need to go and so forth. So, um, one of the, um, the themes that we have in a number of the questions that were submitted is things like, I have um, you know, a five-year-old grandchild who's going through transition um, and, the, 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 um, and the parents are affirming, or I have an eight-year-old cousin, you know, this, this kind of thing, this family member kind of issue. And so um, if you could respond, David, um, if you could help to, to answer how they might respond and how to support them, that truth and love, compassion that you were talking about. And then Renee, I'm gonna to turn to you and your experience as well to answer that question. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, when I work with uh, younger boys, usually 12 and under, I don't really work with the boys, I work with the parents. Because uh, as I pretty much indicated before, that there's, there's trauma at the bottom of all these kinds of issues. And so, okay, what do I do about it? Well, yeah, truth and compassion ends up being the same kind of thing. Here's, what, here's something, I'll get really practical right from the beginning. Something that might be a very good home intervention to help the child navigate these issues. Uh, and we have books written about this specifically, so you're, you don't have to just listen to me. There, I can recommend uh, books about these specific practical things to do. If it's true that there's something inherently emotionally off or going on within the child's uh, mind or, uh, or, or the, the relationship issues uh, between mom and dad and the child, that are, something's, something's off, okay? The key is to focus on the relationship. Kids have a natural, automatic desire and uh, mechanism to, to become. And so they will copy, naturally, that parent who they feel most identified with and what makes most natural sense for them. And so what we'll suggest in, in cases is that a very loving, very affectionate, and I do mean physical affectionate uh, relationship, which is probably not there so much, uh, before uh, needs to take place. A very authentic eye-to-eye, -eye, body to body contact where that child feels safe. Children who go through these issues really don't feel safe. And sometimes you can't detect it at first because they all end up uh, pretty much being good little boys and girls and they, they want to satisfy their parents uh, and so they'll do anything to, you know, to lower their anxiety. Well, if that authentic relationship really is transformed so that the emotional, even navigating conflicts, if that relationship stays intact and is specifically worked on through various emotional experiences, not just talking but doing things, uh, that child needs to know what it feels like to navigate conflicts that are internal and they feel that, wow, my parents are really there for me, their anxiety lowers, you'll see them naturally go more towards the same sex parent and be more okay, less defensively detached. So creating these kinds of experiences at home that are very close-knit, that inspire emotional connection, mm -hmm. that's what needs to happen in terms of, I could go on and on about a lot of details about that, but that's what needs to happen in principle to really affect the emotional issues that are being repressed at the time. I hope that helps. Very good, David. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? Good, good job in the back. <clears throat> um, I can't speak <clears throat> to the issue of what I needed as a child because I do not know what a family, what it feels like to be in a family that I feel safe and feel trusted. I, I, I grew up without that. So I don't know, <clears throat> I, I see, uh, Shannon's home and her kids and the pictures on the wall and to me it's an alien experience but since I've come out <clears throat> trying to help other people suffering from this I'm in correspondence with a lot of parents whose children are going through this <clears throat> what I have found works for them through 
long discussions into the night. First and foremost, um, most kids really don't want to discuss, they don't want to be intimate with their parents emotionally. And as a result of that, <clears throat> oftentimes the, the kids, the neighbors, kids down the block know, the dog knows, the cat knows, the, the, the sociology teacher knows, and the parent's the last one to figure it out. Um, so what we are finding is the parent, in, and my gut feeling is the family structure has broken down so much. The parents are working so many hours. There's no communication. There's no intimacy. And worse yet, there is no trust in the family structure. And you have to build that trust up you, so you have communication that you're not ashamed of, if I as a child. So if I could have talked to my mom about this, if my mom had been there, I don't think I'd been here if my parents, you know, had a, were a little bit more together and present. But now I'm finding so many of the, the female to males, uh, uh, transsexual children, are in homes with um, single mothers which is, <clears throat> I'm still trying to get, wrap my head around this one. So my rule of advice, if first off, at, at its most basic core, gender is the social role in, in society. I'll say that again. Gender is the social role of an individual, not male and female, but the social role in the societal structure. And the very first structure the child meets is, is the family. And if there's something wrong, if the relationships are off, the, the, whatever the dynamic is, and Margaret Mahler's uh, research on early childhood development says it starts between zero and four years. By the time you're two or three, it's, it's like you've got these issues. So look at that point. D learn if your kid comes out, your cousin, your niece, your, your son comes out, whatever it is, start by reestablishing trust in the relationship, communication, and that intimacy because the family is where these issues start, the family is where these issues end, and the family is where we then take what we've learned to be how to be a man, how to be a woman, into the next larger family, which is um, intimacy with uh, boys and girls, intimacy, and into adulthood. So you have to build the trust, and if the trust isn't there, the kids won't open up, they, they go to the school counselors, and next thing you know, they're on puberty blockers. And here's what not to do, one example, <laughs> all right? Three-year-old boy happily <clears throat> runs around the house for about a month in his mother's red high heels. Don't do anything. Don't slap his rear end or shame him for doing that. No, you want to send a, a guy, a, a boy into uh, transgender issues or homosexuality? Yeah, shame him, shame him from the time he's two or earlier or, or later. No, you might have to after, I don't know, a month or two kind of go, hey, you know what? There's this other cool thing dad's doing over here and redirect the child. Now that might be okay, but what you don't want to do is shame a kid just because he's trying to co copy mo mommy one day. Uh, because what he's really doing, which you intimated to very yeah. beautifully, is what he's really trying to do is to be close to mommy. That's what's really going on w when those kinds of things happen. Don't panic, in other words. And don't send him to a gender doctor. <laughs> and that's the other thing not to do. Right. Don't think, he wanted to put on pink nail polish. Well, okay, I guess you're really a girl. Okay, let's make an appointment. <laughs> what? So, anyway. Thank you. We have a lot of questions kind of dealing with a, a, a lot of different facets of this issue, but the next question I'm just gonna keep with that theme, but maybe we can make this quick so we can move on to the other ones. And that is, uh, how do I address an adult who I've known since the age of five who wants me to call him by his new female name? Don't look at me on this. <laughs> okay, uh, please, somebody. <laughs> I'll take that one just because Shannon and I were talking about that earlier. And Shannon, can you tell your great quote that, and then I'll play off Yeah. Okay, I think it was Pope John Paul II that, uh, that said that um, 
so many there's so many wounded soldiers on the battlefield and we can't just go into them on the battlefield and start saying okay you know you've been living a sinful life you know you you know start preaching to them about the choices that they've made in their life no they're bleeding out you need to put a tourniquet on and you need to save their life first after you get them stabilized then you can start having those kinds of conversations with them and i feel like that for me and the the people who i have interfaced with I feel like I want to call them what they're asking me to call them out of respect to them and hope that it begins a dialogue with them. Um, so That's exactly what I was going to say. I agree completely. I, I think that if we refuse to use the name they've chosen for themselves, it shuts down any further conversation. And I think it's okay to use that name, and I think it's okay to address them the way they've asked because it shows you respect them, you respect their wishes, and it gives you an opportunity to go further in the conversation. It doesn't mean that by calling them that, there's ways, there's ways to, to go about continuing to call them what they're asking to be called, but they can still know that you're not, you don't think that this is the right choice. There's ways to do that tactfully, so. Uh, Sorry, real quick. On that note, I just wanted to add a little caveat. Um, so in the schools, there have been the, the school, some schools are trying to censor our speech. And in that instance, I completely disagree. There is an example, I believe in California, a little five-year-old had a coming out party in the school and another student used the wrong gender pronoun and they were sent home. Um, Nevada just, their Department of Education just tried to pass some regulations that would require teachers and students to use the gender pronouns and names of the students. And in that instance, I believe as parents, we need to fight against that because how do I explain to my five-year-old that he is a she? I, I don't want to, I don't want to lie to my children and I don't believe they need to be sucked into the delusion of someone else. So as adults, I think there's a place to have a respectful mm -hmm. conversation and a place to engage in that. But when we're talking about our children and speech being censored in the schools, I think that's a completely different issue and I would fight against that and encourage you to do so as well. Very briefly. Um, ben Shapiro is one of my heroes out on YouTube and he's always going up against trans activists and he says, listen, for adults, this is your delusion he, he says, I do not have to recognize it or play into your delusion. And where I'm at now is, uh, I don't care if you call me Ramon. <laughs> you know, whatever you need to. But here's the thing, I do not believe you folks should go to jail or be fined for misengendering uh, me simply because you see through the, the makeup and the, the plastic surgery and the, the breast augmentation and you say, oh, he. In California, for nursing homes now, it's a, it's a, a, it's a crime to call me he. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your natural instincts to call me a man are going to put you in jail if, if you go past uh, Verdi outside of Reno. So I, I'm, I'm, the reason I, I sort of held back on this is I just think it's wrong that, and Ben Shapiro says it nicely, he says you can call yourself whatever you know, want to, including Ramon, you have to twirl the R's. And you know, I don't have to play into that. Children are a different issue, schools are a different issue. It's a big kettle of wax. It is, it is. Renee, could you tell us some of the side effects that you've suffered since the surgery? Um, certainly. Uh, within a matter of three years of taking massive doses of, of estrogen, a, a Premarin, uh, I developed marbleization of my liver and my liver function dropped by 30%. <clears throat> I have had chronic uh, stone development in my uh, kidneys and in my uh, saliva glands in my throat. The, the stones that were produced out of my saliva glands, you know, people do get these occasionally and they're usually like small, tiny things. I was getting them the size of, of 50 carat diamonds and I had to have them removed. Um, my first heart attack was at 40. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what else? Um, 
one day my uh, gallbladder simply dissolved and I quickly, in a matter of moments, uh, developed septicemia. That almost killed me a couple years ago. Um, I'm walking between my house and, um, and the yard and uh, next thing I know in my left eye, this is four or five months ago, um, a curtain came down. The retina detached for no reason. I've had three eye surgeries this year. I missed out on a very good paying job back in Vietnam because I had a gas put in my eye and it'll heal for a couple days. The retina will attach for a couple days and then tear away. And then I go through another surgery and it attaches for a few days and goes away. One of my uh, friends was, <clears throat> uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, uh, she was overdosed on Primarin. She was given the equivalent of seven years of Primarin over a three month period and became suicidal when she was taken off of it and went into an, uh, a mental institute to keep from killing herself. And you've heard of postpartum uh, depression? That's from a sudden drop in the, the, the progesterone level in pregnant women. She was pregnant for seven years over a three month period and when she went off of it she lost her mind. M many, fr many, many of my friends have health problems that 70, 80 year old people should have and they're in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Mm. And what would, what would be the connection between, for example, the issue with your retina and the hormones and oh, what about okay. to the, um, the, the breast implants as well? Oh, the, the breast implants. Um, double D's were a great idea 25 years ago. <laughs> Okay, any stripper can, can tell you it was a great idea, you know, when I was working. Um, I have uh, silicon seeping into my body, you know. Uh, breast implants are not made for distance. What are they made for? Anyways, <laughs> um, so there's lots of associative stuff here because what, what, what the problem is, hormones are the most dangerous drug in the world. Not coke, not opiates like you've got the problem here, not crystal meth, it's hormones. And our bodies, by the time we are born, our bodies are geared towards one set of them. Mentally, how we are, our brains are structured respond to that particular testosterone or estrogen. And now, I, in order to overcome my maleness, and at first it was my voice because I was a baritone, <coughs> And I gotta tell you, you know, it took a lot of estrogen to raise this voice up. <clears throat> and as a result of that, a high blood pressure, hypertension, I, I've been on hypertension pills for uh, 30 years because the body is not designed for this. It's the wrong tool for this job. The job was is testicles, is ovaries. Those are the right tools in that right body. Um, Primarin, you know, um, uh, thank you, Harry Benjamin, it's the wrong tool. I just want to interject that, you know, we all live in a culture where we're going to Whole Foods and we're buying hormone-free chicken, and yet it's okay to do this. It's a little bit of a contradiction. It's okay if your five-year-olds uh, are injected with, with uh, hormones, but not your chicken breasts. Yeah, right. And I'm sorry too, by the way, for the graphicness of this, but we would be remiss if we weren't digging deep and unpacking what's really going on here. So um, a follow-up question for Renee, just because it, it just flows easy. Uh, did you feel after your surgery satisfied? No. There, here's the thing. You folks, I, I, I really don't understand what your lives are like. Every day of my life since I was a kid, I've woke up and gender has been first and foremost on my mind. I don't know what it's like to feel at peace. I'm 62 years old and I've never known this. And I had the surgery and it's like, okay, I'm finally not going to think about gender. Every day of my life I have to take a pill to simulate being a woman. Every day of my life I have to, <clears throat> if I've had a cold and I'm just coming over bronchitis, my voice is a little lower than it usually is. Every day of my life I have to, you know, I'm in corporate 
and every day of my life I have to get my voice up here before I stand and do a presentation. Every day of my life I have to think, am I passing? I have been in transition my every day. You never leave transition. The surgery doesn't put you on the other side of, of, of gender, of, sexu of uh, uh, anatomical sex. Every day of your life, you are reminded in the mirror when I shave. And I, uh, I still have beard growth in spite of $17,000 in electrolysis. You never leave being a transsexual, ever. You die wondering if you're going to pass at your bloody funeral. And this is why I'm speaking up, because people need to hear this, just like David. People need to understand this, that you're, once you go on this path, it's, you're always on this, on this little groove for the balance of your 40 or 50 years. Christine Jorgensen, I've read all of her work. Um, the transsexuals I know, many of them who commit suicide, just can't do another day of knowing they're a transsexual. Thank you, Renee. David, could you please speak to the precursors of those who, um, for, for those who are struggling with their sexual identity or their gender identity? Yeah, the precursors, make no mistake, we're not talking about genetics. Uh, sometimes the word is used uh, predisposition. If you don't watch the use of that term, you'll and people kind of end up thinking, well, that means genetic, right? No, it doesn't. Here's more of a, a precursor uh, or, a, or a predisposition. Probably uh, a, a rather sensitive personality that somebody is born with. Uh, if you're born with a more sensitive personality, you probably will be more, much more subject to trauma events like uh, neglect, uh, emotional distance, defensive detachment, um, uh, the, 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 the bullying, the, the shame that, that, uh, that, that can happen. Um, a, a precursor uh, looks like um, uh, um, unfulfilled emotional needs. Uh, I, there's a, I take a client history of every client that comes to see me. I ask them all about their emotional history from the time they were small children, and it's always the same. There's different circumstances, yes. There's different levels, yes. But it's always the same basic principles. Uh, uh, masculinity was something that was off-putting from a very early age, very early age. Well, why? Because masculinity, which is, uh, becomes a, something that feels injurious, or who'd want to identify with, with uh, an example of maleness, whether it's neglect or whether it's overt trauma, Who'd want to identify in the identifying stage around three years of age with maleness if it's something that's off-putting or, or God forbid, horrible actually to them? So that's one of the, and, and that develops gender identity inferiority, severe cases of that. And so that's, that's a precursor. Uh, frankly, a precursor really a lot of times is just, well, here's what I tell people all the time. Uh, to, to dads uh, or to whoever the male role models are uh, in the child's lives, if you don't hug your son, another man will. Not giving affection. And some kids, yes, some ki kids need a lot less affection than maybe other kids. Maybe that sensitive boy needs more of a, uh, and thank God for his sensitivity, great. Uh, but maybe some kids need more affection than others. But if you're having a real relationship with your children, you'll kind of know that. So y you got to connect with uh, your kids so that those precursors and then the and then the additional information from the schools that are heading down these paths, uh, so they won't begin to listen to all that. There's nothing that prevents homosexuality and transgenderism more, in my opinion, than a wonderfully connected relationship with parents in the first years of life. Amen. Hope that helps a bit. David, what role do you see pornography playing in the increased rise of this issue? I would say, so glad you asked that question, I would say almost 100% of the boys and men who are in my office now have been absolutely expo exposed to porn. 
Sometimes it's a full-blown addiction, and sometimes it's an intro into male homosexuality. I, I deal with, I do have some female clients, but mainly I deal with males. So pornography is an immensely growing issue. Think about it. What are, what are we letting our children see in the, on our uh, movie screens? Well, I don't know if you've heard about the new movie coming uh, that premiered last week. It's from Italy, but nonetheless, it's a mainstream acting movie. And it, it's essentially t uh, a, a celebration of the story of the lovemaking between an adult man and a 17-year-old boy. Maybe you haven't heard. Look it up on the internet. Call Me By My Name is the name of the movie. You don't think pedophilia is the next roadblock people are trying to get through? It is. So... Um, I'm sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> yeah, porn. I make sure I was right on track here because sometimes I get off. But uh, porn, porn is devastating our society. I could, I could probably spend seven days seminar on porn and how to get out of it. Uh, the good news is uh, that therapy really works for that. There is psychodynamic therapy and other treatments that, that really does release the addictive quality of that kind of stuff. But your children, here's your kid. Oh. Men, enter. <coughs> Naked men will come up. What do we expect, folks? What do we expect? And, and, then, and then we have all the LGBT stories. It, our children are being inundated with this. And I assure you, porn is making billions of dollars all around the world. So it is an issue. But don't want to leave you with a, a totally negative note. It absolutely can be uh, resolved. Because I know this because I'm experiencing this with my clients uh, pretty much every week. And the, their needs for porn, not just a behavioral, oh, don't do it thing, not a behavioral approach. Their emotional um, stimulations, their emotional triggers are, are beginning to dissipate when you have a really solid therapeutic background and have a, a very good compassionate relationship. It really does work. It is hard work. Addictions are hard work. But... It works. I would also say, too, just to add to what David said, that on the Internet now you have individuals who are going through, quote, transition, and they're documenting their whole journey, making it seem so normal. And so younger and younger kids are watching this and thinking, oh, they're giving them a how-to plan on how to go about it. They're journeying each surgery, journaling, video journaling, each surgery and process and so forth. And so it's really kind of almost like a form of recruitment in a lot of ways. Um, so it's 8.35. I promised you that we would end at 8.30, but understand that we're going to continue the conversation. So if you need to leave, feel free to do so, but we're going to continue. Um, this question is for Renee. Oh. Renee. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said that sex changes are happening without any psychological pushback from like the from the counselors. I thought that counseling was required to get a sex change and an approval from a therapy a therapist before surgery. Very good question. Um, Harry Benjamin was a, an old school uh, MD, and. He, he really literally wrote the book on sex changes uh, in 1969, the transsexual phenomena. Uh, when he did that, he wrote something called the standards of care. But because he was really a 1920s German doctor, the standards of care don't even mention psychiatry, a, a, a psychological analysis until I think the third or fifth item. And as a result of that, he did not really place any weight in the process. It metamorphized through Dr. Uh, Stanley Biber into the uh, standards of care is to doing cross-dress living and hormones for one year prior to surgery. And um, what was the question? The psychological assessment. Oh, before. the psychological assessment. Uh, what's happened is um, when the 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 left wanted to get rid of homosexuality as a mental illness. Uh, they went to the DSM-3, uh, and by DSM-4 it was changed, because they're basically just a book publisher. Then the American Psychiatric Association, about uh, 12 years ago, they, they did a vote at a convention without presenting any scientific uh, research saying homosexuality was not a mental illness, but it was a show of hands, and then uh, just a few years ago, the AMA for transsexuality. So 
the, what Stephanie's talking about is now you cannot push back. If a, if a kid comes into you and into your practice and says, well, I think I, I'm, a, I'm a girl, but I'm, I think I'm a boy, you can't challenge them. It, they're, they're, they want this to be the law, and it's, it's obviously working because we went from eight surgeries a month to 10 a day, and we're looking at 20 a day uh, this year and maybe 30 a day next year in 2018. So the standards of care just don't matter. The original ones from Benjamin really don't care anymore. And that is the atrocity because I got to tell you, you can see how screwy I am. Most of my friends are on par with me. And this whole idea of gender identity, personal identity, sexuality, um, you know, loving your mother, hating your mother, it's a ball of wax. And that ball of wax has many components. And what the, a good therapist does is will eliminate 95% of the, the 97 percent of the people who present themselves as transgender and wash them out so they don't harm themselves and traditionally my therapist who's one of the top in the country she was only doing three percent out of a hundred patients for approving them for surgery that didn't mean they didn't get it they'd run off to Thailand so you know, uh, the standards of care at this point are a joke. The standards of care have to start at home and start with groups uh, like Cornerstone. One of the individuals who testified in Conquer during the Medicaid public hearing was um, a, a psychologist from Amherst who had, all, had undergone gender reassignment surgery themselves, uh, and I'm not sure to what degree, but, you know, this is the kind of person that's giving the approval you know, for the procedure to happen. So um, what resources, this might be a question for David, what resources, trainings can you recommend for therapeutic professionals who want to help clients and families with these issues? How do we increase competence? Good question. Go to davidpickuplmft.com. <laughs> davidpickuplmft.com. Next year, you're gonna find training programs that are gonna be certified, uh, not by the APA, of course, but they're going to be certified in authentic reintegration therapy, formerly known as reparative therapy. They thought eventually reparative sounded too uh, negative, so we went ahead and uh, went with re reintegrative therapy. You can also contact me and my colleagues. Uh, you can go to my website and email me, uh, or you can call me. It's fine, available Monday morning. Uh, and and uh, I can, uh, next year I'm going to be start starting to um, take on interns that will, uh, give them full training from top to bottom on on exactly what therapy really is what's this, the etiology and the training to get them qualified like i was i was trained personally for years by the creator of authentic reparative therapy dr joseph nicolosi and so um that's what we're continuing his work so i my me and my colleagues can train you where it's coming you'll hear more about it next year certainly you can go to resources uh on my website and and begin that that process with the resource that's just resources that are on there but eventually you'll need to have some training because this is this is this is deep stuff this is not just cognitive behavioral methods only where you go well you know what you're thinking bad about yourself okay well live a great life instead no, this yeah. this is very deep work. So I th I, I've never had that question before in a, in a situation like this. So uh, I, thank you for asking that question because we are talking about real training that, that would probably take about, oh, three to six months. I, 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 I'd like to add to this very briefly because I know it's been a long night for all of us, uh, that <clears throat> what's happened, what I went through, what most uh, transsexuals go through is you sit in a therapist's office for a year. Therapist, whether you're young and uh, Freudian, Reichian, it's about talking. Okay, at the end of this year of talking, 52 sessions, they say, "Well, you know, my patient um, uh, Renee Jacks still has these feelings, and therefore therapy has not been able to alleviate the cross-gender identity uh, uh, confusion, and therefore they should the the option is to have the surgery." What they're saying is. That's what they're saying. What they mean is the tool I'm using to treat this patient doesn't work. There's a difference in perspective. When they, they say after a year of talking about it, 
we the person hasn't w brought the subconscious to the conscious and they still have this infatuation um, I that is a failure of the tools that they use and in don't get on the plane I bring out all of these doctors uh, backgrounds and I say it's the tools they're using and certainly here is a new tool that is working another tool I worked with a hypnotherapist who had dealt with um, who was specialized in Tad James timeline therapy with a, a female to male transsexual in LA last year and we by going back into her past with hypnosis she identified where her discomfort with her female body developed in in a, a timeline of her childhood and the therapist said now in that moment you're no longer uncomfortable in a female body you are comfortable we did two sessions with this uh, timeline therapy with this woman and she stopped having the ideation she stopped testosterone and is now living as a as a, the female she was born as so the tools traditionally weren't working but they were saying no are our, our tools working psychoanalysis from a Jungian perspective works it's you that can't be fixed, or it's you that can't be fixed. And it's, no, it's the tools we were using. Just a follow-up question with David, because you brought up his name, and I am a big fan of Dr. Joseph Nicolosi. Uh, this person asked, what's the status of Dr. Joseph Nicolosi's work, and how can his work be better disseminated? We've got about four more questions. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm so glad you asked that question, but in the interest of time, I'll just give you the basics. Uh, those of us who are uh, um, reintegrative therapists now, uh, next year we're hoping that the, it'll, the work will catch fire, even though the media is definitely against us, uh, but the, the new part of, of reparative or reintegrative therapy involves EMDR. Has anybody ever heard of EMDR? Okay. It's the number one treatment right now in America for healing trauma emotionally for war veterans who come back from wars that are traumatized. Well, remember me saying earlier, sexuality, transgender issues, they're ultimately about trauma, to be simplistic about it. So when we add the EMDR component into a more in-depth than it was before, it worked well before, but now it's like therapy on steroids is what our clients are pretty much telling us. Uh, it's going much more quickly and therefore more profoundly. And so, uh, Dr. Nicolosi, and uh, Dr. Nicolosi has since passed away last, this, this past year. And so now his son has taken over, and those of us who are his mentor, mentees and colleagues, we're kind of taking over the business, so to speak. And we're coming out next year with uh, a new research study, which we think is gonna blow people's minds, and also books and training programs to really set the record straight and uh, inform people about what's, what's uh, really going on with these issues. And so, um, am I forgetting the question exactly? Just <laughs> how do we disseminate? Yeah, so how do we disseminate? You're gonna, if you really wanna know how to disseminate, it means you're gonna have to take courage and you're gonna have to question therapists and legislators and demand that they are responsible for whatever they tell you. Uh, whatever I've told you tonight, don't believe me just because I've said it, please don't. Go to the internet, I, do your own research. I, I'm sorry, David, but yeah. I believed Harry Benjamin, I believed Robert Stoller, yeah. and they're, they're, they were wrong. Yeah, look at the evidence. It's no, you're not a, a, you're not a right-wing bigot just because you're asking all of these people, how do you know that? Where is that found exactly? You need to ask me those questions as well, all of us. We're, we're open to that. We don't have time to go into big research yeah. projects tonight, but you can contact us, I'm sure, and we'll give you references. So to disseminate that information is going to have to happen through your schools, through your legislature, and yes, you're actually going to have to talk about it. You're going to have to, if this rings any bells for you, you're actually going to have to take action. And if you need help, would you please call? Email. Call us. We'll help you. We've got all the bullet points. We've got probably all the information you need. Let us know. We'll help you. We'll help you kick yourself out the door and get get to work in whatever way that works for you maybe in little ways maybe in huge ways totally up to you i would just encourage you to act act for your children renee
Did you? Uh, it looked like you were. Oh no, I was waiting. pointing towards you. Oh, yeah, to interject. Uh, okay. So on the point of helping, another question: How do you find a therapist who that would support phys psychotherapy that um, that you talk about, David? Okay. Here's another website for you. Right now, NARTH, the National Association for, Thera for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality, is the only uh, secular uh, psychological association that agrees with all this and is, is out there promoting research and accuracy in science. And I'm a board member of NARTH. Well, if you go to NARTH.com, that's N as in Nancy, A-R-T-H.com, you can call them and get a referral from, uh, from, to check out if there's anywhere in your area or somewhere close to you in the United States of a qualified person who, uh, does, who does competent therapy. So there's a resource for you. You can also pretty much do the same thing, since I'm a board member and know all these issues, by just contacting me yet again at DavidPickupLMFT.com. And, if, and if you, you need that, the oil in that. your Buick change, David, <laughs> David <Ash>. pick up <laughs> <laughs> If you need tax advice, don't come near me. Okay, there's another question for you too, David, um, and I think it's a good one. Do you have any faith at all that the medical community will stop su succumbing to the PC pressure and start engaging in legitimate, honest, objective medical science? My faith right now is in two people, God, who will work his purpose, regardless of what we do or think, and people. I don't have any faith very much if, if good folks like you, in your corner, even if it's only in your little corner of the world, don't speak up or in some way push forward this agenda. That's where my faith is, uh, not just in myself, but in, in, in folks like you and in all the states that I speak for, especially in Texas, uh, and it's going pretty good in Texas, uh, but still needs more. Uh, but but that's, what it, that's why, if there is any faith, yes, as long as people act. All right, this is a question that could be for, for any of you, and just, just we got just a couple more questions here. What can we do to encourage a healthy view of sexuality, making it less hush-hush in places like church, et cetera? There you go. Just, go for it, girl. You wrote the book. We'll chime in. <laughs> well, you, men you mentioned church. You. Yeah, church or anywhere. Church or anywhere. Well, okay. I'll, I know you've got stuff saying this, but I'll, I'll speak first. Um, I grew up in the repressed church atmosphere. I'm just. I'm not being antagonistic. I'm just being. My effort is just to be honest. I think churches need to take the families by the hands and have, believe it or not, church programs that are authorized by priests or pastors, whoever, and get down to the facts and teach their members what's going on. Have seminars, have <laughs> preaching, have uh, lessons that are designed on specifics. Not, it doesn't have to be graphic, but just specifics that treat sexuality as, a, as God's gift. That's what you want to teach your children at home as well, that this is God's gift. Uh, sex should be a marvelous thing instead of some shame-based thing or some wild, weird thing. It should be uh, safe, and it should be sane, and it, it should be something that not just uh, procreates, but something that, let's face it, is pretty great to feel, all right? So if you teach your children that in very holistic ways in, in uh, it, it, either church or home, then you're going to save your children and society loads of heartache and, and issues, uh, uh, emotional issues years down the road. We've been subjected for at least 100 years to Victorian mentality. Church people especially, in my opinion, tend to have a rather shame-based view of sexuality. Oh my gosh, sex, what? I, I hear fathers all the time, what? I can't talk to my son who's 12 years old about sex. You know, the, the typical sitcoms are, you know, the, the sitcoms, are, sitcoms are all anti-man, basically. The men are either stupid or horrible, all right? In sitcoms so what's wrong with fathers being taught by priests or whoever or people have been through these issues about how to talk to your your boy about sex both how wonderful it is and how careful you need to be at the same time mm -hmm. it should come from the parents so that's how to do it is to educate yourself and 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 all band together with uh, <coughs> parents and churches alike Go ahead. I, um, I I have a different perspective and what? Um, <laughs> I have a slightly different perspective is for a moment I'd like to do an exercise with all of you 
I want you to imagine your mothers and fathers in their, if you know them, in their senior years. You know, maybe the, if they're still alive, that's great. But imagine your, all of your older mothers or fathers or your grandparents in their senior years. Now, imagine walking into the bedroom when they're doing it. <laughs> I say this because there is a sense of embarrassment. A, a natural, they gave you birth, but there's still a sense of embarrassment. And I've known a lot of kids who said, oh my God, I, my, you know, 40 year old parents, I, I, I went by and the door was open and, and I can't see, I'm blinded by this. <laughs> I think what, I think the intimacy issue around um, your sex drives versus your children's sex drives versus your 85 year old parents' sex drives there's a human element to the embarrassment and to want to keep this intimate thing to your own self. And I think we're, this is a very good question, you know, how do we bring it out of, of the closet? Well, I don't believe um, thousands of terabytes of, of uh, databases on IBM servers um, having porn is the right way to do it. So once again, it comes back to saying, you know, and you see this with kids, you say, well, son, I need to talk to you about the birds and the bees. And the kid goes, oh God, you know. So once again, have that trust. And the family is the cornerstone of society. It is the foundation of society. And the integrity of that concrete goes back to trust and communication. So if you want to have a, if you want to bring this this issue, so your kids can talk to you about homoerotic uh, kinds of stuff, about fantasizing, about tying people up, whatever the range of, of it is, you're there. And should they feel comfortable talking to their mother about this, hopefully there's a dad or an uncle that they can. Would you speak to the connection between gender dysphoria and Asperger's autism? Oh, good question. God, you're testing us. I mean, is this like on, on the final yeah. quiz? It's like you're in the presidential primary in New Hampshire. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what we ask tough questions. Make? Let's make America great again. That's what I've got to say. Where's your hat? Oh. Um, I, I have to uh, tell you, I'm, uh, I, I have no problem in saying that I don't know. I'm not fully qualified to answer that specific link. Now that I've heard that question come up just in the past month, very interestingly. And so I, I, I think we're beginning to hear some of this. But I'm, I can't give you an astute or qualified opinion on that. Because uh, I, I literally, if you're talking about knowing, I don't know well, if there is a link. I suspect that there has some, there's some correlation, but I can't speak I, to that I've tonight. heard of the same correlation in, in two different uh, research papers while I was uh, in Australia. Here's the thing. The, the percentage of the population that is suffering from a true transsexualism, uh, gender dysphoria, is such a, 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 a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of 1% that putting any money into this doesn't make any sense for most medical firms. You know, how many people have ovarian cancer? How many people um, are struggling with um, spinal injuries, with uh, prostate cancer? It's around numbers. You know, the more numbers are, the more number of people that are going to uh, be, uh, be, that's where the focus is, the squeaky wheel, the, the largest number of, of breast uh, cancer. And even though I've seen this in some studies, th the number of people suffering from this, I'm sorry to say, don't qualify for the, the research bucks. And that's what I'm, that's really why I'm here is to try to say don't do the legislation because once you do the legislation around gender and around homosexuality, there will be no research, proper research as to what causes this in the relationship to uh, uh, other uh, diseases and, and syndromes for another 20 or 30 or a century if you legitimize and normalize these conditions. Mm -hmm. This is a question that I am not, I don't fully understand, but maybe one of you might. Please clarify the 10 day sex surgeries. Is this in the US only or worldwide? Do you know what that is? 10 day sex surgery? Mm -hmm. um, for male to female transsexuals, 
Um, after they remove uh, the penis and the testicles, they have to cut through the perineum uh, muscle uh, between the anus and uh, where the urethra comes through. The surgery is extensive. Cutting through that muscle literally requires a lot of healing before you get out of bed. I was in the hospital uh, for 15 days. They're trying to get it down to 10 days to, to cut down on the cost of, of the hospitalization. <clears throat> but here's the other thing about these surgeries is once you remove your natural uh, production centers, your ovaries and your testes, that uh, your body goes into a type of shock for anywhere up to two years. And it's trying to adapt to the nat unnatural synthetic hormones. Uh, for myself, uh, it was a year before I could work. It, for my friend who took care of me, who had her sex change later, she was much older, it took her two years before she could get up for more than an hour or two. So if you fund sex changes, you're also funding people to be on disability for years, and some of them don't get there. And the other side note to this, are you also going to fund sex changes for those who regret it and want to go, the 5%, 10% that go, want to go back? You know, $50,000 every pop, $50,000 every pop. And then you're going to be funding $500, $600 in hormones every year. And then all of the associated uh, health issues. You know, are you going to fund a $7,000 tracheal shave? Um, the, the money, I've done all the numbers for New Hampshire, the, 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 I would hope that you'd spend the, the 15, 20 million dollars on the, uh, sex changes where you can do a lot of good. So, I'm sorry. I, I, Renee, could you speak to the thymus study? To the? The, thym the, the thymus, the hypothymus? Oh, um, I need to stand up. My legs are cramping. Um, <clears throat> Why don't you come over here because we'll use you on the mic. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for your patience tonight. I, I'll wrap this up fairly quickly. Um, a woman doctor I knew in San Jose, California, uh, name was Robin. I can't remember her last name. She theorized that the hypothalamus, which is like right up here and inside, uh, was responsible for the feminization of males in the fetus and believed that <clears throat> if she could get her hands on enough hypothalamuses from dead transsexuals that <clears throat> she could then compare them to that in genetic females, okay? And she finally, she asked me and I said, well, I'd consider and, and I was concerned she'd actually do the surgery right there and take my hypothalamus out. Um, so I w didn't give her permission, but three other individuals did, or four individuals. It was a very small sample. <clears throat> and she said, oh, by the way, here's three uh, or four genetic females and here are uh, uh, the e equivalent number, and lo and behold, the transsexual's hypothymus looks like uh, 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 genetic females. These people died after years of estrogen treatments. So uh, the, the problem with so many of these attempts to, to justify, quantify, uh, answer these questions is that there's no money for it. And the sampling is so small, you cannot, uh, there's been 3,500 this year, there's probably been 20,000 sex changes over the past number of years, people going out of country, going to Denmark, going to, at one point, Casablanca. The, the number is so small that the number of, of people in a test survey group is also equally small. And any of you who have done a data sampling and data analysis, uh, big data numbers, you know that you, uh, if you take 100 transsexual patients and you say, well, we're going to do a, a, a sampling of three patients. Okay, so that's three patients, but at that point, those numbers may not apply to the, the other 97. I, I've worked with, in my project management life, I've been working with these kinds of, of extrapolation of, of valid data from large data sets, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of, of samples. 
and you're, you get off very quickly. You know, you get one person who's an anomaly, and since this is an anomaly of an anomaly, we don't know. So when we talk about Asperger's, we talk about uh, um, uh, lesbian behavior in male to female transsexuals. It's such a small number of the population. We need more information. We don't need to be legislating until we know what we're doing. So I am going to ask a final question. Of the e each one of you, what is the number one thing that you want the people in this room to walk away remembering? I'll let you go first since you're right here. Oh, okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, the number one thing, um, when you see a tall transsexual who's blonde and wearing a pinstripe suit, take them out to chocolate cake. <laughs> Uh, the number one thing is this is an epidemic. It is man's doing. It's doctors doing. It's society's doing. It's uh, political. It's been weaponized. And the only way we're going to deal with the epidemic is to stop sex changes, um, puberty blockers for children. We have to stop the source of the epidemic, and then we'll try to f uh, deal with the whys. You know, we know how it manifests itself. Now we need to know, moving forward in the 21st century, why we now have people wanting to dress like this. Stephanie. So if I'm an attorney, so if I may, can I, can I say something else? <laughs> and then I actually would like to give you two things. But someone asked a question about pedophilia in the bill, and I, they were asking if the therapy ban bill would ban pedophilia. And um, naturally, I'm thinking, I'm sorry, ban therapy for those struggling with pedophilic, I don't know, feelings. So I'm reading, I'm sitting here reading the text of the bill again, and uh, am quite, have never gotten that question, nor thought about it, until David said the direction we're going is legalizing pedophilia or make normalizing it. And I'm reading the text of the bill, and in fact, if anyone would like to make an argument that someone could not get treatment for pedophilia, that would actually be covered in the bill. How scary is that? The language of the bill says that you cannot um, work to eliminate or reduce sexual or romantic attractions or feelings towards an individual of the same gender. So that would include, there's no age restriction there. And I don't think any of us thought of that because normal people don't think that way. Um, and so thank you for bringing that to my attention. Uh, I do work with 40 other states and I believe they'd be very interested for, to get an email from me tomorrow <laughs> raising this as an issue and that our legislators need to also consider that they've actually, what they've done is um, in the language of the bill is prevented someone from getting therapy for pedophilia but a caveat is that this bill as it's written applies to um, minors those under the age of 18 so I'm not sure how that would work legally David and I would have to talk about it but thank you for that so takeaway be bold don't be afraid to speak up. Speak to your teachers, board of education, school boards. Please go to the legislative hearings. Just don't be afraid that you're gonna say the wrong thing. Just as a parent, a grandparent, somebody with knowing children or an interest, don't be afraid to just get up in front of a microphone like this and say, hey, representatives, I have concerns about this. I don't agree with this. We need voices, we need backup, we need reinforcements, we need you. And the second thing I'd like to say is Cornerstone um, does really good work. As you can see, this kind of event isn't cheap. Us talking to the legislators earlier, that took a lot of planning um, and a lot of people working to bring us together here, flying us all out. And so if you um, 
have it in your heart. If you've learned anything today, if you've taken away anything or found this valuable, please think about going to the Cornerstone website and donating and supporting their efforts. If you can't do it now, think about doing it. Yes, think about doing it before the end of the year. Um, we really need all the help we can get and they really need financial support and your testimony and just if you have any questions, call. That's what they're there for. Hey, this school board meeting is coming up and I need talking points. Can you help me out? That's what we do. And so feel free to call, email. We have the resources. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Um, there's no research that proves being uh, gay or transgender is genetic. There's just, there's no conclusive research, I should say. And also, I have to add other things, know that change is possible. It's not mandatory, it's not forced, but it's possible. And I experience it every day in my office with my clients. And so help me get the word out. Help all of us get the word out. Educate. Legislate. Act. I just want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. I really appreciate you taking the time to educate yourselves, to therefore go out, like Stephanie said, and to educate others. We are recording this this evening, and we will be making it available, so check your email uh, for that. Yesterday, we recorded Renee um, telling her story on video as well, and we'll be making that available. That's a, a, a greater length, uh, and so you can be looking out for that as well. And please, you know, ch if you don't get our emails, please sign up for them on our website, nhcornerstone.org. Also, share it with your friends. You know, tell them about Cornerstone. And when you forward it, though, take off the unsubscribe button at the at the bottom so that they don't unsubscribe you. I know there's a couple people in this room that that's happened to. So, uh, so make sure that you take that off. But please, you know, share and to spread the word. Thank you again so much. Thank you.